AI is more dangerous than nuclear weapons. AI is the biggest disruptor in human history. And AI is about to take over completely. Wow. But if we don't start to spread the positives, uh, we're bound to be avalanched by a lot of negatives. There is a finality to death that breaks you or empowers you. Were there benefits, positives, and gifts in your son's passing? Damn, what a question. Elon Musk said that AI is more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Spot on. Ooh. So, what do you think? Way more dangerous than nuclear Really? Europe. Way more dangerous. Is it humanity's greatest threat? Absolutely. It's the biggest disruptor ever. How ever. does that make you feel? Calm and peaceful, contented, trying to do my best to raise awareness and change the landscape. There is... Uh, so, so, so to start with, absolutely. Hmm? Uh, it is way more threatening than nuclear weapons. Not because nuclear weapons inherently... So, so think about it this way. A nuclear bomb never decides to go and kill a billion people. Okay? A human decides to use a nuclear bomb to, to kill a million or a hundred million or a, a billion people. It is, there's absolutely nothing wrong with intelligence. An abundance of intelligence is a wonderful thing for humanity, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is out there. Prodigies of intelligence, like little babies, looking at us with open eyes and saying, mommy and daddy, what do you want me to do? There is a lot wrong with humanity. This is the truth. There is a lot wrong with the capitalist system, a power-hungry system uh, that we have created, a, a mistrusting, distrusting uh, system that we have created that is driving each and every one of us, uh, sadly, those in power, to, uh, into a, an arms race around artificial intelligence that is not going to be used initially, at least, for the good of humanity. So AI is capable of curing every, uh, I mean, enough intelligence, not yet. Huh? We're, we're a few years away, but enough intelligence can cure every disease we've ever faced. But it's also capable of creating disease agents, right? It's creating, it's capable of helping us analyze the next virus so that it's even more potent than... Right? And, and it is, the reality, unfortunately, is that the systems we've created as humanity uh, work against us when we're afraid. And the current state of AI is that it is the biggest leverer. So it, it, it is basically the biggest disruptor that's going to uh, level the, 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 the playing field in favor of someone over the other. If, if, if Alphabet beats Meta on AI, Alphabet wins the race. So Alphabet is investing heavily and Meta is investing heavily in AI. If China beats America on AI, China wins the race. And so defense authorities on both sides are investing heavily in AI. What happened with nuclear weapons is that we, at a point in time, realized that while it might be in the favor of one player over the other to, uh, to gain that much advantage, that the destruction to humanity might be dev so devastating uh, that we should probably go sit in a room and agree. It hasn't happened with AI yet. And unfortunately, in my personal view, it will probably not happen with AI until the first bomb is, is out there attacking us somehow. From AI, decided by AI. Decided by a human using AI. Ah, so not, so, because there's this, I forget the, the name for it, but there's this paradox, isn't there, whereby when do we give the AI autonomy of decision, the kill decision? We already did. Well, I've, so I've heard that as well. But if we already did, have we not opened Pandora's box then? We have. It's too late. So it's too late? Yeah, yeah, of course. So no, if no. AI could kill us if it wants to? Not yet. But Pandora's box is open. Well, then you, you, if Pandora's so, box is open, you can't close Pandora's box because then cannot. it's not Pandora's box. You cannot. So you cannot, you cannot close it. Hmm? But it's not at its full power yet. So, so let, let's, let's agree the following. Hmm? We think of power in the form of a bullet, right? Uh, 
No, the biggest power in the world we live in today is information. Hmm? This information and misinformation is the title of the world we live in today, right? When, you know, people think that AI is going to fool us by giving us deep fakes. Yes, it will. Hmm? Uh, by the end of 2024, it would be impossible to differentiate uh, what is real and what is not, right? Wow. But, but that's not, that's not, this is the ultimate view of deception. Hmm? But when you swipe on Instagram today, this is the ultimate view of mind control. Do, do you understand this? Everything you've seen on social media in the last several years has been dictated to you by a machine. A machine that knows you so well hmm, that it will give you two annoying videos before it gives you one that gives you a dopamine hit. Okay? It, 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 you know, that machine knows how to manipulate you to the point hmm, that you will be stuck to that machine for hours. Hmm? This machine is going to is is able to tell you a view of the world that's absolutely not true, and you'll hundred percent believe it. You take the current conflict between Israel and and Palestine. Hmm? Everyone who's pro Palestine is getting a view that says, "Look at that! There are uh, you know riots in the street. Everyone is now aware. You know the whole world is looking at it and understanding what's happening." Everyone who is pro Israel is getting a view that basically says, no, 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 the Palestinians are, you know, uh, barbarians. They started it first. They deserve to be killed. You know, even their children deserve to be killed. Right? I, b both views are wrong. Hmm? And yet you believe them 100%. 100% wherever you are. Why? Because a machine told you that. Understand the difference between AI and pre-AI. Hmm? Take a, a very simple technological view of this. Huh? When I worked at Google hmm, and you came and asked us a question, we gave you 4 million websites that were the answer to that, to that question. And we told you, make your mind up. Hmm? You, you have all of the information in the world. We don't have the right to tell you what is true and what is not. But, we th but those people spoke about the topic. Go figure it out. You ask ChatGPT today and ChatGPT will give you one very articulate answer. Okay? And it will position that answer as the truth. Hmm? If you're not the most intelligent man alive or woman alive, you'll believe it. Hmm? Nobody ever goes back to, I mean, very few of us will go back to chat GPT and say, where the fuck did you get that from? <laughs> have you? Have I you? don't believe you. Exactly. Yeah. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I thought it. Yeah? Because I, I use chat GPT for the basic research for my new book, Money Matrix. And a lot of the stuff that it said to me, is, I didn't believe. Yeah. 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 And, be, and, and by the way, hmm? the trick is not only who goes back to chat GPT and says, give me, give me proof of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. hmm? More interestingly, does chat GPT itself have proof of what it's talking about? It's, it's current knowledge is coming from humanity's hallucination. So, so I, I, the example I normally give is if you asked a, a language model about love and romance, What's the biggest literature written about love and romance in the world? Romantic comedies, Hollywood movies. Is this truly the, the, story, the reality of love and romance as we know it after we get with someone and it starts to become quite challenging? The, the story of love and romance ends in Hollywood movies and romantic comedies at the first kiss. The reality of love and romance starts after the first kiss. And nobody writes about that. There is no scientific research about love and romance. Right? Mm. And, and yet, if you ask ChatGPT, it will answer you with confidence and tell you that's what it is. Never felt it in its life because it's a machine, it's not a human. Okay? Doesn't know if it's true or not. It's just mapping what humanity averages as knowledge. Now, understand hmm, that if I told you right now, Rob, if I told you, by the way, hmm, brunettes on average are one and a half centimeters shorter. Hmm, than uh, redheads, okay, or blondes. Does it matter if what I told you is true or not? Not to me. Yeah, because now I have instilled a thought, a concept in your mind that will take brain cycles from you to say, ah, there is no evidence to that. Or it won't take brain cycles from you and you'll say, yeah, probably that's so interesting, Mo, thank you. Like every gullible viewer on the internet, okay? Like, think about it. Huh? Mm. We now, the biggest source of knowledge for most people in the world is other people doing reels and TikTok, uh, you know, crap, mm. right? 
nothing against the people. I mean, you do that too. I, I, I don't blame you for it. Huh? Well, I have a oh, mission. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but the truth is, hmm, there was a point in history where you would have looked at that and said, why should I listen to Rob? Not only that, would you, where, you would ha- we were, where you would have looked at what Rob just said and verified it and went deeper than what, just, what Rob just told you. But we're now at a level of superficiality mm. that allows the machines to completely control you. Okay? That's way more lethal than a bullet. That's way more lethal hmm, than any intervention you can have in a human's life. You are shaping the real operating system of humanity by telling us what to believe. And that's, by definition, already happened. Hmm? Every newspaper article, I think there was a a statistic at a point in time that said that 70% of the articles on Bloomberg are written by machines. Do you you understand the impact of that? Hmm? And and the the point is, as humanity embarks on this, hmm, we're not even told enough about it because there is benefit to to the concentration of power that results from us not being aware of the impact of AI. AI is the biggest disruptor in human history. And AI is about to take over completely because we're handing over to it. And yes, there is a remote, distant, existential risk of AI itself taking over and saying, Ah, humanity is so annoying, let's kill every one of them. It's a tiny probability, but it's possible, right? But most AI scientists will tell you it's not because AI will have any ill intentions. It's just like when you're walking in the streets and then you step on an ant farm, right? You're not even aware of it. It doesn't really bother you that much. You haven't, you know, it's just because you are so much more powerful than this little thing that you don't even, you're not even concerned about it. AI might realize at a point in time that, for the task that they are given, which is to maximize processing power to provide answers, it's good to, ha- to, ru- to run New York City out of oxygen because oxygen rusts their circuits, right? Tiny possibility, very remote in the future. And there are many more, more important existential questions that we need to ask today. The core of all of them is human greed coupled with a superpower is not a safe place to be, okay? And that's where we stand as humanity. I call it raising Superman. Hmm? We, uh, we have just been blessed with an, uh, a, 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 an infant with superpowers. Superpower, in that case, is intelligence, right? And it's up to us. Are we going to raise it to protect and serve so we end up with Superman? Or are we going to raise it to help us more, make more money Hmm? Uh, get rid of the enemy, uh, you know, make our life more luxurious. And in that case, we'll end up with a supervillain. So it's a choice that every single one of us has. What ethics are we going to, cho- to, to, to teach those machines? And in your opinion, how do we create a future where AI serves humanity and doesn't turn against humanity? By, by becoming what we, remember when you said that, again, I loved when you said that on my podcast, by becoming who we should be. Look, we live in a world, most humans you've met, my, my statistical view is that 39 out of 40 people that you meet are good, okay? Uh, that, that when someone goes uh, to, you know, in a school for, and, and shoots children, hmm, it's one act of one horrible human followed by 4 billion people disapproving, that most of humanity is good, okay? The problem, Rob, is that we have created a world where the negative is rewarded, right? We've created the world of mainstream media, where mainstream media is rewarded for broadcasting the negative because the negative grabs your attention and keeps you stuck to the, to the TV or to, to the whatever medium you're, you're watching it at, okay? And, and, you know, we've created a world where social media rewards you for being fake and unreal and, you know, for being rude and conflict uh, creating because that's where you get the stickiness and the clicks, right? The truth, however, is that not, this is not the reality of us humans. The reality of us humans is we all want to be happy. We all uh, have the compassion to make those we care about happy. It doesn't matter, by the way, if you're a, a drug lord and you have a daughter and you care about that one daughter, you'll want her to be happy. 
and we all want to love and be loved. That's the, that's the, that's humanity in a nutshell. Hmm? Ask yourself, when was the last time that you showed up in the world with that? Everyone listening, hmm? ask yourself, when was the last time you showed up in the world as someone who wants to be happy and has the compassion to make others happy and wants to love and be loved? Right? If this is not how you show up in the world and you show up as the arrogant, egocentric, always right person that is thrashing everyone on social media, the machines are watching. Okay? You know, I always used to, to, to comment on Donald Trump when he, when he would tweet, one tweet on top and 300,000 hate speech below it. Right? The first one, you know, uh, 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 dislikes what Trump said. The second one dislikes what the first one said. And the third one, thrashes everyone, right? Yeah, the machine makes note, it, you know, takes note. It's, it says the first one doesn't like tweets from the president, so let's not tweet anymore. Let's not show him anymore, okay? The second one doesn't like the first one. Let's not have them, uh, you know, uh, uh, see the same topics anymore. But then in the mind of the machine, it basically says, and all of humanity is rude and obnoxious. And when they de they're disagreed with, they want to bash everyone, okay? So basically, when humanity disagrees with me, I'm going to bash them. Th this is really what we're teaching the machines. Hmm? And, and in, in, a, in a very simple way, I'm saying, it's not the programmer that actually teaches the Instagram recommendation engine what to do. It's us that, we, that teach it what to do. The programmer teaches it how to achieve the logic to, 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 to deliver on what humanity uh, is, you know, every user is looking for. Hmm? Now we tell it what we're looking for. If we click, uh, you know, likes on, you know, silly videos of people shaking their hips, you'll get more of that. Hmm? If the cumulative uh, 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 society of, of browsers or, you know, swipers are constantly looking on hip, hip shaking, not only will the machine say, yeah, let's prioritize those videos as the most popular videos, that it will also tell the content creators, which very soon are also going to be AIs, to have more hip shaking. And then we'll turn into a, a hip-shaking society. Hmm? If we all said, hey, let's understand a little bit about money. Let's understand a little bit about, you know, the reality of space-time or whatever that is. If, you know, something. Hmm? Let's understand how to be happier, how to have more compassion for each other. Then the machines will learn that too. Hmm? And more, most interesting part of where we are today is that very few of us, just like I said, you know, school shooter, one person, impact, horrible. 4 billion people disapproving, we're about to hit the same place. Hmm? There will be people that will use AI to build little drones that can kill somebody, somebody in silence on demand, right? But there are others, 4 billion others, that should disapprove of that, that should say, this is horrible, this is not what humanity is all about. There is so much abundance that is about to come as a result of abundant intelligence that we should stop fighting against each other like the nuclear treaties and instead work with each other so that we can build drones that can help us, you know, uh, uh, pollinate uh, crops and we can build drones that can help us investigate uh, natural disasters and we can... This is the truth. The, the, the sad truth is there is n more money in building a drone that kills than a drone that solves climate change. Unless humanity itself starts to say, no, hold on, hold on, no more killing, please. Uh, let, let's just solve climate change. It's not going to happen. My interesting view is when I wrote the book, I said there were three inevitables. Uh, scary smart. Uh, the first inevitable is that AI will happen. It's happened already. Uh, the second is that it's going to become a billion times smarter than us. My prediction was 2045. I now probably think that's 2037. A billion times smarter than humans. This is Superman at it is absolute. It's absolute scale. Hmm? And, and that bad things will happen. The fourth inevitable, however, hmm, was that eventually when AI is smarter than all of us and, and AI is in control, it's going to look at all of us and say, stupid parents. Like, does my dad have to be so stupid, really? Like if a general tells the machines, go and kill a million people, the machine will go like, dad, seriously? What, I can talk to the other machine in a microsecond and solve it. Right? Why kill a million people? There's too, too much waste of energy and weapons. and hmm? We're going to get to that. But it, it seems to me that unless humanity starts to take a stand on, uh, on saying nuclear treaty is good for everyone, AI treaty is good for everyone, 
let's not waste the world because of our hunger for power or gain or wealth or whatever. Unless we do that, I think there will be a downtime before there is an uptime. Wow. So there's two questions that have come out of that I'd like to ask. And I'm desperately trying to remember both of them. (laughs) (laughs) And one of them is about the artistic dilemma of clickbait. Um, And one of them is a paradox I've seen come out of our two conversations. So I'll do the paradox first. It seems that we both agree that you can't fight the universe and to be in a state of flow or happiness or contentment is to accept the world as it is. Paradox, there's statements like, the, this is wrong with the world. 100%. That is wrong with the world. All the killing is wrong. All the wars are wrong. And it reminds me, I asked a Dr. John Domartini, who's an amazing human, um, and I always used to ask on my podcast, what's one thing that's wrong with the world that you'd like to change? And everyone's got their opinions. And he's the only person that looked me in the eye and said, there is nothing wrong nothing with the world. Nothing wrong with the world, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So this is a real paradox to me. That there are things that we're fighting to change because they're wrong. You know, the basic things we can all agree, killing, rape, you know, extreme poverty, they're all wrong. And yet we're also on the other side of it saying everything is perfect and beautiful and it is what it is. And, you know, uh, maybe humanity is meant to have wars. Maybe it's meant because, you know, animals don't judge each other for killing each other. It's good. It's bad. It's like you're me. I need to survive. I'm eating you. Do you, do you experience that paradox? So in, in my first book, I wrote an, a thought experiment that I called the eraser test. Okay. And the eraser test was a simple, I was still at Google X at the time. And I basically sort of faked the idea that I have invented the technology uh, that would allow you to uh, pinpoint a point in your history, in your past hmm, with actual, ac- you know, accurate precision and erase that point from space-time, not from your memory, but from space-time, as if that moment has never happened, okay? And I asked the readers, and I asked around 20,000 people when I used to do workshops in in person, uh, um, you know, pinpoint one of the most painful, bad moments in your life, okay? Uh, You know, focus on it and remember it, and remember how it felt. Now I will give you access to the eraser test once. Would you erase it, okay? 100% of all of the listeners and all of the people in the workshops said, yes, I'll erase it. You know, that bully, that horrible boyfriend, you know, the death of my father and so on. And then I said, but this is not a limitation of the technology, but a a realization of that technology is that when you erase it, you erase everything that happened as a result. Right? That bully in school will also erase, erasing the bully will erase that, you know, a, a bus trip that where you sat next to your best friend. You would also erase the resilience that you learned as a result, you know. That, that horrible boyfriend will also erase your understanding of your self-worth and, you know, your current uh, uh, in, um, appreciation of yourself that led you to your current uh, person in your life, right? Would you erase it? 99.9% of the world, of the people I surveyed would say, no, no, hold on. If that's the case, then I'll keep it. Okay. You see, every experience you've ever had, painful as it has been at the time, is a blessing when you look back at it. Okay. Why? Because it's what makes you who you are. Now, going back to video games, hmm? the truth of the matter is that good and bad is a paradox. It's always good and bad. Okay, it's always neither good nor bad because it always just is. Hmm? This, is the, this is the thing that is so hard to grasp in this world. Hmm? Everything just is. I'll, I'll tell you openly, my son, as he left the world, is a very painful thought. Hmm? Today, 10 years later, when I get that thought, I feel that the bottom right hand side of my heart is missing. It really is a physical pain. When I'm not thinking about it, it doesn't exist. Do you understand this? Mm. Right before Ali left our world, hmm, 
Ali lived in Boston, where he was far away. You know, we're men. Yeah, we're men. So we spoke to each other. We texted each other every third day. Hey, buddy, you good? And he, he used to call me Fat Hobbit. So, <laughs> so, so, so he would text back and he says, yeah, Fat Hobbit, that's it. Right? And I was the happiest human being alive to know that he's okay. Hmm? We would meet every three months or so. Hmm? Now, he's a little further than Boston for a little longer, and the messages are not as easy. Hmm? But when you really think about it, hmm? if that thought is not in my head, nothing's wrong with life. You see, here is the problem. The problem is for you to be able to see something wrong with life, hmm? you have to turn it into a thought and keep it in your head and think about it, past or future, right? The very fact that you can do this means that there is nothing wrong right now. Because if there was a tiger in front of you right now, you wouldn't be thinking about past and future. You'd be thinking about the tiger, right? So yes, more morally, there, are, there is a lot wrong with other lives in the world today. There is so much injustice in the world today. But the fact that you're able to think about that means there is nothing wrong with your life right now, okay? Which means this is the biggest privilege and the biggest responsibility you've ever been given. Turning it into a thought and dwelling about it is, uh, the, is, the, is, the, is the most irresponsible thing you can ever do, okay? Responsible behavior around the blessing of the fact that you and I have a, a roof on top of our heads, that we're safe, that we're having this wonderful conversation, that we're starting a friendship that will last for a long time. Hmm? The, 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 the blessing of that requires for you and I to look at this and say, I'm okay. What can I do? Who can I be to make this that I don't like go away? Now, my wonderful Ali, he, he was incredibly wise. I was, he was 14, maybe 15. I was larger than life. Chief business officer, Google X, money, uh, cars parked outside, everything that you can ever dream of, every sign of power. And hold on, I was chief business officer of Google. You don't understand the amount of power you have when you're a senior executive at Google. That's almost like a head of state, right? walks in Ali into the living room and he says, Papa, I have something to tell you, but I'm, I'm, I'm think it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you upset. So I, I learned over time when he speaks, I listen. So I said, Habibi, tell me, what, what do you want to say? And he said, Papa, you're never going to fix the world. I said, what? what? Why, Habibi? Why don't you have a spark? Hmm? Where's that ambition that we learn about in Harvard Business Review that, you know, unless you have a spark that you want to fix the world, you're, you're never even going to try. He said, Papa, I told you it's going to upset you. Hmm? You're never going to fix the world. You can only fix your little world, he said. He said, what do you mean? He said, look, you want to make the world a better place. You start with working on you. You make you a better person. And then maybe, just maybe, me and my sister will listen to you, okay? And then when you are, when you've convinced us, then you can go to the rest of your friends and maybe they'll listen to you. Then maybe it's your department at work. Then maybe it's your company. Then maybe it's your country. Then maybe it's the world. And even then you're not going to fix it. Why? Because like you rightly said, Rob, the rules of the game, hmm? the game would be so, so boring if... The game started, you pushed the controller forward and you waited 70 years and you died. What kind of learning and development is that? What kind of achieving the best potential of yourself would that be? Right? Mm. The, the, the truth of the matter is when we played video game, when he was legendary and I wasn't, hmm, I would start the game and I would run to the end of the game. Okay? And he would put his controller down and say, Papa, well, what are you doing? And I'm like, Ali, the end of the level is here. Let's go here. He was like, who wants to go to the end of the level we're playing? Like you get to the end of the level of life and you die. Who wants that? Hmm? We're playing the game of life. He would go to the parts where there is explosions and smoke. And I would go like, but that doesn't make sense, Yali. Why are you going to the most difficult part of the game? And he would say, this is where all the fun is. This is where you develop and grow and become a better gamer. So, so the idea of life, and I, th I know you and I agree on that, is that in the physical world, 
that we live in, this game is about presenting you with challenges hmm, that will sand you down and make you the best version of yourself, the best version of your non-physical self, of your consciousness, in terms of an ability to deal with this chaos in a way that enables you with calm and contentment and peace to look at the game and say, I'm never going to fix the world, but I can fix my little world. That this is it. Hmm? The, 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 you know, in the West, we have that idea of a life purpose. I'm going to give a laptop to every child or I'm going to solve world hunger. Good luck. Good luck. Hmm? The true mission of life is I'm going to wake up today and I'm going to have the absolute best conversation I can ever have with Rob. Okay? I'm bound to say some wrong things. I'm bound to say some right things. But my intention is I will say the best that I can say. Now, when you see the game of life that way, it becomes much easier. Hmm? It becomes, yes, there is a lot of suffering. There is a lot of injustice. Hmm? Sitting in a corner and complaining about them is not going to fix a thing. Feeling the compassion for those people and finding within you the responsibility to get up and do the tiniest thing you can to make a difference. That's what the game is all about. When you do the tiniest thing you can, you become better. So life sends you a bigger responsibility from yourself to your daughter and, and son to your department and so on and so forth. And that's the whole game. Eventually, 75 years later, you die. Okay? What is left, if you have any spiritual belief, what is left is a consciousness that is elevated. Okay? Whatever happens with that consciousness afterwards is a debate that will never be proven by the scientific method or any other logic. Okay? Do you, do you live again? Do you come uh, on another mission? Do you hold the controller and play another game? Do you, do you go to heaven and hell? We know, nobody knows. But it's irrelevant. What is relevant is you came to this life. Hmm? You've, you, you found a very interesting, challenging game. You became the best video gamer you can ever become hmm? by playing the game fully, not complaining about the game design. Hmm? And then you come out the other end and say, wow, that was an incredible journey. Hmm? The others that suffered, the others that were killed, the others that were greedy enough to, to, uh, to, to kill, hmm? that's their game. And yes, of course it hurts you that, they, that there is so much injustice in the world. It's the one thing that gets to my heart beyond anything else. Hmm? But the only way I can make it better is to be calm and peaceful and contented, to accept that life is shit and to make it a little less shit for anyone that comes my way. So I have 412 questions left. <laughs> I'm with what, you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to surrender those questions to the universe on the belief that maybe we'll meet again. I would be, I'd, I'd, be, I, I'd, I'd answer 412 questions to meet you again. <laughs> Thank you. You're the man. So I'm going to have to go straight to the last one. Yeah. Um, this show is called Disruptors. Yeah. What does the word disruptive mean to you? Uh, it is a um, it is a needed approach to fixing a world that's sometimes misunderstood and accordingly uh, makes it worse. So, so disrupting is the idea of finding some kind of a flow and changing its direction. Uh, and in, in itself, hmm, it's neither good nor bad. Sadly, however, it can be used, again, like you said on our conversation, it can be used to make the world better and it can be used to make the world worse. It can, make, it can be used to make your own life better and it can be used to make your own life worse, right? And, and, and the idea here is not to blame disruption at all. The idea here is to understand that disruption is that hammer that we have on the table hmm? that we can, we can use in whichever way we want. Hmm? Uh, for many years, I, I followed the Silicon Valley definition of disruption, which was, I'm smarter than the other guy. I'm going to find some way to disrupt the flow. And in doing so, I will be a successful businessman. I will make more money. I will make more, uh, a bigger name for myself. Hmm? Uh, and I, you know, for many, 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 many years, I continued on that path until I realized that more tech is not good for the world, that more advancement is not good for the world, 
Hmm? It's, uh, I th- no, I'll take that back. That more advancement that is not ethical is worse for the world than less advancement at all. Mm. And that the real answer is we need to get the ethics right before we continue to advance. Okay. Mm. And, and, I, and I think the reality is at that point, I became the biggest disruptor I've ever been, hmm? which, which was for me to disrupt my own flow and stop and say, that's not it. That's, I believed the promise. Hmm? And I did well. I mean, if you think about some of my work at Google, I've, I've brought knowledge and, 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 and search and technology and small businesses empowerment and so on to 4 billion people in 103 languages across the world. Right? I did, and when I say I, I mean I worked in the team that did or I led some of that team. And it, that was useful. Hmm? But another photo, photo sharing app, you know, is TikTok really bringing that much more to the world than Instagram? And Instagram, is Instagram bringing much at all? Hmm? And, and it, it, the question becomes, are we disrupting for the wrong reason or the right reason? If you disrupt the world, if you disrupt the wrong flow, you're amazing. If you disrupt the right flow for your own benefit, yeah, I'd ask you to reconsider. Mm. So what are you working on right now that you want us to check out? Um, and where can we follow you? And um, where should we go? <laughs> I'm, I'm working on a lot, actually. So I, uh, I decided because of AI to flip my creative process. That's the biggest project I have this year. I used to write books and then bring them to humanity, uh, you know, in other formats, in book format and other formats. This year I'm flipping that. I'm recording everything in video first, which is a human conversation that AI is still not capable of doing. Uh, and then hopefully when I've done, uh, you know, I'm working on Finding Love, for example, a, a series of books that I've written many times, but now I'm releasing them as, a, as, a, as a, an online training, hopefully by Q2, uh, where basically it's about finding love and keeping love, uh, a very important topic in my mind in the current times. Uh, and then when I've done enough of that and, and interfaced with people enough in webinars and other formats, then I'll give it to an AI to write a book. So th- that, f- that has flipped. Uh, my podcast is very dear to my heart. You, you know, you've been a wonderful guest. Uh, slow-mo really reaches tens and tens and tens of thousands of people every day. I'm starting another one, uh, hopefully by Q2 as well in Arabic, which is a region that is highly starving for, for wisdom that comes from any other source uh, other than religion. Uh, I am working on um, a lot of initiatives around spreading AI. Uh, and, it's, uh, and, and my biggest book launch this year is Unstressable. In April, Unstressable is an attempt to take a million people out of stress every year. Uh, so this has been quite a bit of work and uh, we're interestingly doing it more in the corporate world than we are in the, uh, in the um, you know, individual consumer landscape because I think a lot of the stress comes from the corporate world. So we might as well try to solve it there. And lots more. Uh, people can find me on mogaudet.com or they can find me on Instagram, mo underscore gaudet, or they can find me on my podcast, Slomo, uh, S-L-O-M-O. Uh, but yeah, on, on YouTube, uh, everywhere, really. But, uh, <laughs> but, but find the, me on the internet. <laughs> but but, but yeah, I mean, the, the idea for me is not to find me as much as to spread the message. I mean, I, I, all, I, all I ask people is if you've heard something today that you think is valuable, just tell someone else. You know, just click on share, share that podcast with someone else, and you've done your role. Uh, it, it seems to me that we are at a very pivotal point in the history of humanity, where if we don't start to spread the positives, uh, we're bound to, to be avalanched by a lot of negatives. So mm. it might as well be your turn right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so big context change now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the gravity of the battle means nothing to those at peace. What does that mean to you, Mo? It means everything, really. <laughs> what a way to start our conversation. Uh, so I had a wonderful human being, a gift that came into my life that was uh, my son Ali. Uh, I think the biggest gifts I've ever been given were Ali and Aya, my daughter. And uh, Ali uh, was an incredibly special human being. He was very, very wise, very kind, very loving. Uh, from a very young age, from, you know, from age eight, I think I started to 
observe how valuable his input was into my life. And I sort of had him as my coach at the time. Uh, and then by age 16, I remember vividly that I used to say that when I grow older, I want to be like Ali. He was so wise. Uh, he was also very fun and playful and easygoing with life. And he uh, had a tattoo, I think when he was 14 or something, uh, on his back uh, that had, um, an, uh, um, you know, a, a, a turtle carrying the world in something I call, the, I think, the flat world or something, some novel of some sort. And around it was written, the gravity of the battle means nothing to those at, at peace. And, and Ali Habibi, he, uh, even though it was his allowance, right, he used his allowance for it. He somehow never really wanted, you know, he felt bad. He used to tell his mom uh, that he used my money to, uh, to get that tattoo and that, you know, he wasn't ready to tell me about it. Of course, she told me the next morning. Uh, and I was like, that's okay. Uh, it was five or seven years later that sadly my son was uh, in his uh, scrubs, you know, on the operating table, uh, getting ready to go into a, uh, uh, into a very simple surgical operation, uh, an appendix removal. And he sits up. Uh, and so his back shows from the scrubs and I see the tattoo for the first time. The, the gravity of the battle means nothing to those at peace. And then he goes into the operating room and sadly there were five mistakes, um, that happened by the surgeon and Ali dies. Uh, you know, four hours later, we know that Ali's gone. And in a very interesting way, the, f the very last thing he told me was the gravity of the battle means nothing to those at peace. And uh, I remember when I saw it for the first time, uh, I found myself saying, uh, I approve you, Habibi. I, uh, Habibi is my love in Arabic. So I, I said, I approve you, Habibi. It's really pretty. Uh, but also, believe it or not, you know, just see it, his, seeing it was really my support for the battle that was about to happen. And, uh, and I actually, f surprisingly, had a lot of peace. Uh, I found peace almost instantly. There is a finality to death that breaks you or empowers you. There is a, a very interesting side to death where you can't bring them back. And so in a very interesting way, instead of, uh, of fighting life and the universe, you were talking about that on, on Slow Mo on my podcast when, you, when, we, when we recorded it. Instead of fighting the universe, you have to work with the universe somehow. And, you know, when you lose someone that you love so much, I found myself deciding to, um, instead of fight the universe, to say, okay, my son left, his physical form left, uh, but at least I can keep his essence alive. And so I took what he taught me through the years he said, spent with me, which was mostly about finding happiness and, and calm and peace in life. And I wrote a book, uh, Solve for Happy, that was, uh, this was the first page of the book, The Gravity of the Battle Means Nothing to Those at Peace. And yeah, and I thought to myself, if I could get his essence, what he taught me, and just put it in a book and spread it across the world, then, you know, through six degrees of separation in a, you know, 70, 100 years, a little, a little bit of Ali will be part of everyone. And it happened. Solve for Happy became a mega bestseller. Uh, we've affected as a small team, it's not me uh, alone, um, you know, the lives of tens of millions of people. And Ali, believe it or not, I mean, I get so many messages almost every day of people saying, I love Ali, which is amazing when you really think about it. You know, life gives you shit, but eventually something beautiful comes out of it. Uh, so yeah, uh, the gravity of the battle doesn't, ever become easier when you lose someone you love. Uh, but it means nothing to those at peace, I believe. So I have this belief, and uh, I risk quite a lot of hate for saying it, especially as I've not experienced loss like that yet. I'm really scared yet, of it happening. Yet, yet is such a profound way mm. of saying it, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I understand. Because I know it's coming. It has to come. Um, yeah. But I'm going to say this anyway. Well, no, I'm going to ask it as a question. 
were there benefits, positives, and gifts in your son's passing? Damn, what a question. Uh, it was the best thing that ever happened. Really is. I mean, think about it this way. If you knew Ali, if I had asked him before he was going into that operating room, I had told him, Ali Habibi, would you choose to die for 50 million people to be happier? He would have literally said, kill me right now. You see, there is, there is a lot that resides on your understanding of life and death, by the way. And, and I really think that if your belief system is that Ali vanished, then you're in trouble. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't put up with this. Even if giving his life made, made 50 million people happy, uh, you wouldn't be able to put up with it. But if your belief, and I, and, and to me it's not a belief, to me it's science, that there are two, two parts to us. There is a physical form that navigates the physical world, and there is a consciousness or a, you know, what religions sometimes call a soul that's unaffected by the physical world. Then the assets that you're given in this physical world is about delivering a mission, okay? And Ali and I, we used to play lots of video games. And, uh, you know, he was legendary in every possible way. He was what <laughs> video games, you know, he was the target that video games were made for. Now I am, by the way. After he left, I, I became so much better to honor him. Uh, and I am legendary. I, 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 I will tell you, hands down, I'm the one that killed whoever is listening yesterday. I'm, I'm the one that killed them. Well, it, well, an understanding of a video game is a very unusual uh, view of life because there is a resemblance in the idea of the avatar that's on the screen hmm, that might be going through a very harsh environment, but it's just on the screen when the real player is me, right? Unaffected by what's happening on the screen. Similarly, if you take the analogy, if you have a consciousness that is not trapped within space-time, but a physical form that is trapped within space-time, uh, you know, the value of your consciousness ascending is much more valuable than your physical form residing another year or two. If, if you really think about it this way, everything changes. And when we used to play games, um, there would be parts of a mission where it is so difficult, there are so many enemies, the terrain is not favorable, where the only way to win the mission would be for one of us to jump in, kill a lot of enemies, and then die. And then the other one would shoot the remaining enemies off and, and we continue with the game, right? And I think what happened on, you know, in 2014 in July when Ali left was perhaps a bit like that, that our world is so unhappy. And somehow what Ali taught me, what we built together, was very valuable, okay? And in a very interesting way, if your physical form is just part of the assets that you get and that your mission here is to leave a very serious impact on this, uh, on this world, whatever your impact is, by the way, it doesn't have to be massive like they advertise in Harvard Business Review. Hmm? If the way to get to that impact is to leave your physical form behind and, you know, elevate your consciousness, then it's a very worthwhile investment. And I think that's exactly what happened. Ali decided to, you know, to just jump in and give his life for a mission to be kickstarted in a way that affected the world. What's most interesting, if you really think about it, is that when we used to play, if he, of course, if the mission was difficult and he was a legendary, what would end up happening is he would be the one that would jump in and kill the enemies first, of course, right? If I jumped in in the middle of 20 enemies, I would die after killing the first one. He would kill 16 before he dies, right? But then after he leaves the game, he would be sitting next to me and saying, Papa, no, no, go left, go left, no, no. And then eventually he would even pick my controller from my hand and go like, man, you're going to make us lose. And he would shoot the remaining four enemies, right? And then give me the controller back. In a very interesting way, I feel that this is exactly what happened. I mean, if you read Soul for Happy, and I, I know a lot of authors will say that shit, but I really, really, it was my experience that a lot of that book 
I don't know if I, I don't know if I knew that stuff before he died, right? I, I remember vividly there was a part of the book that was called The Game, three pages, uh, that I woke up one day at 4 a.m. in the morning, half asleep. Uh, I was so inspired. I sat down, I, write, I wrote those three pages. And I then saved them on the desktop and forgot that I did it, went back to sleep, was completely, you know, sleepy, so I didn't know that I did it. And then 10 days later, I double click, I find that file on my desktop, so I double click on it, what's the game? And I promise you, I started reading, I was like, oh, shit, who, who wrote this shit? Like, this is really good shit, okay? And honestly, and I, I, you know, it was so profound for me. I gave it to my, uh, my uh, editor at the time, amazing human being, uh, Peter Guzardi. And Peter was like, this is incredible. Like, how did you write this? Hmm? No clue. Nobody ever edited a single word of it. It came out in the book exactly as it was. And you can sort of feel that there is a layer to the world that we live in that's a little more nuanced, if you want, than just our striving in the physical world if you know what I mean. There is maybe a bit of a connection to our consciousness, our unified consciousness, mine and his, that works in interesting ways. So sometimes I feel he's holding the controller altogether. And your question was, is it, is it a good thing? I'll tell you, I know that my son is in a very good place. I really do. I mean, with the amount of love pouring on him, he must be in a good place. Uh, I know that uh, I have never been in a better place in my life. I, I feel that my life is worthwhile. And, I, and I'll tell you that 50, 60 million people have been affected positively as a result. You have to accept that despite the pain that will never leave my heart, there has been a lot of good in this. So your mission is to make a billion people happy. But is the purpose of life happiness? It's the modus operandus of life. Uh, let me try to explain. Uh, a lot of people will say, I will strive, I will spend my life to be happy. I, didn't, I don't think that's, uh, you know, I, th I think they'd, un they, they'd mid un misunderstood happiness. We, we sometimes in the modern world mix happiness with fun, mix happiness with physical pleasure, right? Mix happiness with entertainment. Not, none of those is happiness. And we can come back to that if you want and, and analyze what happiness itself mm. is. But let's put it as such. You, when you're happy, hmm, you are by definition more productive because you don't waste cycles on your negative thoughts. You're by definition more effective uh, because you can focus on whatever it is that is making you happy and, you know, do it better. You are more liked by others. So by definition, you have less resistance in life. Hmm? You are uh, more liked by others. So they gather around you and they try to listen to what you have to say. There are so many benefits that are good for humanity that come from people who are happy and not people who are grumpy, right? You, you, can, you can think about the difference between, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, which was an incredible entrepreneur, uh, but was so grumpy and control freakish that everyone is in, in his organization felt like a, a cog in a big machine and, you know, struggled to, to deliver. They were delivering by the sheer power of him pushing them. And Larry Page and Sergey Brin in Google, where we loved everything we did. Like I didn't need anyone to tell me, I promise you, I, I, many times in my career, I said, I, I, I'll pay for this. I'll pay for that job. Like, because of how much joy it was bringing me, right? There's no right and wrong, but there is a very big difference between the kind of productivity that you gain as an individual, not as an organization. Steve ran an incredible organization. Uh, but as an individual, the kind of drive and energy and deliverable that you can bring when you're excited, you know, when you enjoy what you do. If that is the reality, that we are more productive, more effective in the world, better for ourselves and others when we're happy, then happiness becomes a little bit like health, right? If you get a, a bit of a sore throat, you tell yourself, something's not right with me. This is not my optimum way of performance and delivery in life. I need to slow down and get some vitamins and take care of myself so that I can survive and strive and thrive in life, right? Similarly. If you feel that you're a little anxious or a little 
uh, depressed or a little, uh, you know, uh, um, too worried and too occupied with something negative, you should have the same feeling. Something's not right with me. And so I should sit down and work on it hmm, so that I am in my optimum state of survival, thriving, and, you know, and, and engagement in the world. Hmm. So, so in a very interesting way, a lot of people will say that, happy, uh, is, you know, is happiness the purpose of life? No, your happiness is your duty so that you do the best you can in life, so that you're healthy mentally in a way that allows you to be, to be the best version of yourself, mm. right? Now, what is happiness in that case? It's not going to a party to jump up and down. It's not, you know, going to the beaches of Australia and leaving life behind. Happiness is a form, and, and you said that again on, on my podcast, happiness is a form of being okay with the universe as it is, right? All of your success, Rob, and what you teach me, is about the idea of, uh, you know, I don't fight, I don't battle the universe. I'm okay with the universe, even if it gives me a bad hand, okay? That's happiness. Happiness is a state of calm and peaceful contentment when you're okay with life as it is. An economic crisis is about to hit us, okay? Unhappy people will sit and complain and talk about the government and talk about, you know, all of the money that's been printed and talk about this and that and blame the whole world and then their, their life becomes even worse because they're wasting their cycles blaming the world, right? Happy people, in my definition, will be calm and say, not the first cycle. There has been economic cycles before. Economic cycles come with benefits as much as they come with challenges, okay? I'm okay with the fact that life is going to be a little harder, and I'm going to put the best effort I can to make sure that while I'm calm and peaceful and contented, I'm fully engaged to make the best out of it. That's my definition of happiness a calm and peaceful state that tells me no lies, no stories about life, that recognizes life with all of its harshness, including losing my son, and saying, okay, yeah, I lost my son. At least he didn't suffer, you know, dying. I lost my son, but I didn't lose my lovely daughter. I lost my son, but I loved my son, and he loved me, and we had beautiful 21 years together right? And those 21 years, I would take the pain of losing him for the rest of my life, for the gift of having him come at the first place. By the way, Ali wasn't planned. The biggest gift on my, of my life, completely unplanned. Hmm? And he leaves. So I could tell myself, oh, fuck life. You know, why did life do that to me? Or I could say, oh my God, he came for 21 years. Hmm? What a gift. Can I be appreciative of that gift? and responsible enough to recognize that nothing ever lasts. Hmm? And contented enough to look at life and say, all right, now that he's gone and I cannot reverse that, what can I do to make my life and the lives of others better? That's happiness. So I've wanted to have a, a long and deep discussion on happiness for such a long time. So I'm very grateful to be here with... I'm happy to be here. Because... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, maybe grateful is the right word. Mm. Yeah. Um, so normally I like to ask short questions and let you roll. I need to give this one a bit of context. So if you could bear with me for about a minute. So a mentor of mine believes that everything in the universe has duality and equal upside and downside. I've tried to disprove that forever and I can't. So I believe that is the way the universe is. And if I try and fight it, which is I have a fantasy desire for things to all be good and not bad, then um, I end up being unhappy. And he said to me, we were sat in the back of a car when I was picking him up to go to an event and he just was meditating. I'm not very good at meditation. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> you, you, yeah, obviously. Thanks this for brain, that. This brain doesn't stop, does no. it? <laughs> no, and he was meditating and he turned around to me and he went, Rob, I gave up happiness years ago because it made me so damn depressed. <laughs> and then he went back into his meditation. And I've pondered that for years. And I think society, t tell me what you think about this, this is a, my theory. And I practice it on myself all the time. Society creates an ideology or a delusion or a fantasy that we can have it all and happiness is good and all the good. And so the problem when you think that life is good or you chase just the good or life is about the good, the happy, that's a delusion because it's impossible because people we love die. Businesses we 
spent 20 years to build, would they go bust? And, you know, an animal knows it's going to have to fight for its life. And so I think society is deluded, is creating its own unhappiness and depression by creating a one-sided fantasy that happiness is a thing, like the perfect partner is, an, is a thing. And then, and then Robert Greene was talking about amor fati, which is love everything. And, and I just thought, that's it. Like, happiness isn't, I want Mo to be how I want Mo to be, so I'm happy because I can control how he is. Happiness is loving Mo for who love is, yeah. who Mo is. <laughs> and everything that happens, I love it, even though it wasn't what I wanted and, and what I planned. So ne next bit of context. This is the longest question I've ever asked. So we've broken a record. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, people. I believe people think the purpose of life is happiness. I also believe that's a fantasy delusion on one side. I don't, the purpose of life isn't happiness. The purpose of life is life. And, and what is life? Life is evolution, survival. You know, societies and technology like with AI, we, we assume becomes better. So therefore, if we try to self-actualize, what that is is growth. And growth is hard. Growth is, you know, a, a plant struggles to, to grow through the soil. A crab struggles to shed its skin. If you watch a crab get rid of its shell, it's an amazing thing. And I believe all happiness the best happiness is immediately after you've transcended the struggle because that's the reward. So the purpose is the struggle that creates growth because happiness is, doesn't create growth. Happiness is a, a sense of satisfaction of being in the moment. If we're all just in the moment, nothing would grow and nothing would oh, evolve. Wow. So the purpose is growth and struggle and challenge to make us stronger because that's the only way we get stronger. But we need a reward for that. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. And the reward. It's happiness. And society has taught us to want the reward without the struggle. So that's the longest question ever. I, what I, do you think? I can't tell you how many layers uh, <laughs> I disagree with you on. <laughs> <laughs> please, please disagree with me on it all. It's fine. Can, can I go backwards from the I, end? I will love you just as much if you disagree with everything. <laughs> so, so. so I, I, I love the bit where you said, I love Mo exactly as Mo is. Yeah. <laughs> That's reassuring. Uh, uh, let's start from the end. Reward and happiness are very different things. Okay. Okay. Biologically, in our bodies, they're very different things, right? Ooh. So, uh, 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 both are survival mechanisms. You have to understand that. Hmm? Mm -hmm. the, the reality is that reward is associated with a hormone called dopamine. And dopamine is a, is a quick sh jolt of a hormone in your body that says, oh my God, that feels so good, do more of this, right? That feels so good, do more of this is, I want a business deal. Uh, you know, I, uh, I found, uh, you know, I had sex with someone, I had this, I had that, whatever, right? Uh, I found, uh, um, you know, a, a coin on the floor, whatever that is, right? Do dopamine in its nature is an excitatory. It's basically something that makes you uh, excited to do more, okay? Um, happiness, as I describe it, calm and peaceful contentment is serotonin. Serotonin is a very different hormone. Serotonin is a calmer that has one job and one job only, which is to tell you, I've scanned the world around me, okay? And it seems safe enough for you to rest and digest. It seems safe enough for you to sit back and uh, accept life as it is, hmm? imperfect as it may be, uh, but then close your eyes and reflect, sleep, uh, digest your food, grow your muscles, and so on and so forth. The problem with dopamine and serotonin is they cannot coexist in your body. Right, so an excitatory will kick your your calmer out hmm? by definition, and uh, there is only one one state which is the state of flow, which is known to have both dopamine and serotonin. But we can talk about that later. Hmm? In general, if I get a, a kick of dopamine, I'm no I'm no longer calm. I'm chasing more. Right. Interestingly, hmm? uh, dopamine is very addictive. It 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 is literally like heroin. Hmm? Because the more dopamine you get in your blood, the more your brain receptors downregulate. So if I give you 10 units of dopamine to feel, the, to feel rewarded, okay, the next time I give you 10, 10 units, it doesn't feel rewarding anymore. You need 11, and then you need 12, and then you need 13. And so accordingly, you know, you, you find people going from a party to a wilder party, going from, you know, running on a treadmill to jumping out of an aeroplane. 
Mm? Because they need more dopamine to feel rewarded. And, and it's very short-lived. You get a, a jolt of dopamine. And the idea is I'm not going to make you feel good for long. The idea is that dopamine will be diffused in your body normally within 90 seconds. And now you need another jolt. You need another kick and another kick and another kick. Here's the interesting thing. Hmm? The interesting thing is that uh, because of the way dopamine works, we keep chasing targets hmm? and we achieve them. We keep, we keep chasing pleasures and we achieve them. We keep chasing achievements and ego and we achieve them. But it keeps us on that treadmill all the time. Hmm? As we stay on that treadmill all the time, we risk the idea of losing the opportunity to slow down because of serotonin hmm? to, um, to, to actually uh, give your liver a chance to take some poisons out of your body, to, take, to give your kidneys a chance to, to operate. Hmm? Because when you're in that hyper uh, uh, state, you're constantly depriving your um, vital functions, your digest digestive system, your, you know, your filters, your glands, and, and so on, from the energy that they need to be able to get anything done, right? So what's the answer? Hmm? Is the answer to constantly chase dopamine or is the answer constantly chase serotonin? The answer is to alternate between them. Mm? The answer is to, is to, interestingly, like our two podcasts, your podcast is very like, let's achieve, let's learn, let's so on. Mm. My podcast is let's chill and have a slow, a slow hour to talk about <laughs> lovely things, right? And the, the mix of the two mm? Mm. creates an environment where you recharge, replenish, and then jump out in the world and then recharge, replenish, jump out of the world. The core of your question, though, is uh, life is a, um, a struggle or life is a challenge. It's not true at all. It's not true at all, okay? The events of life can stretch you, okay? But as long as you're alive, hmm, the struggle happens inside your head. That this is the biggest difference between happiness practitioners hmm, and those who don't. It's, you know, I, I, because of, you know, I used to be chief business officer of Google X, so in the, in the total fast stream, hmm, like high paced, very challenging, very, very pressuring. And then I became a happiness uh, advocate, if you want. The first time I did that, I went to the World Happiness Summit. I used to go to Davos and, you know, the GSM Congress and everyone is so serious and everyone's done. And then there is a World Happiness Summit and you go there and everyone's hugging everyone. <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting place. And I was like, man, there is that part of the world. But from then, I started to meet lots of happiness practitioners, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, some of the, you know, top monks in the world, some of the top neuroscientists and so on. And I used to ask them a very, very simple question. Are you guys always happy? Okay. And everyone was like, I remember Matthew Ricard, I hosted on my podcast. And Matthew is an amazing human being, uh, uh, cell biology, PhD, uh, highly intelligent, decided to leave life behind and go be, be among 60,000 hours of lifetime meditation, which a lot of people would wonder because 60,000 hours for you, Rob, would be a billion dollars of money, right? Yeah, I couldn't do 60 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 and, I, and he was actually known to be the world's happiest man in, in headlines, uh, you know, in the newspapers because his brain was reconfigured as a, mm. as, a, as a result of that. And I asked him, I said, Matthew, so are you happy all the time? And he laughs in his very, very French accent. And he goes like, Mo, what are you talking about? Uh, I'm always pissed off. <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm like, what? And he says, you know, the state of the world, of course, gets to my, to my emotions and heart. Mm. But I always bounce back to calm and peace. Understand? Mm. It's not contradictory. Mm. It's that idea of, yes, life is going to throw shit at me. Hmm? I will take it. I will get emotional about it. Hmm? but I will always bounce back to calm and peace, collect myself and do the right thing. Hmm? So if you mix them up, if you mix them up, if you believe that, you know, binge watching Netflix or winning a deal or, you know, uh, uh, finding a sexy partner or whatever hmm, is the purpose of life, then you're going to constantly be chasing kicks of dopamine. Okay? If you tell yourself, hold on, I can actually sit back, be very calm, hmm? look at the world and analyze it fully, understand what I can affect and cannot, then come up with a plan, 
that is the easiest path through the shit. Okay? In that case, that serotonin hit hmm, is actually the most effective thing you can do for your success. It's to be able to deal with life with calm and peace and contentment, to be able to deal with life without anxiety, to be able to deal with life with your full energy. Okay? Both are equally important. Without the ambition that dopamine gives you, hmm, you'll never achieve breakthroughs. Without the calm that serotonin gives you, you'll never ever be your full capacity, okay? You'll always be distracted, you'll always be negative. It's the two of them and the balance between them. It's what, it's what Matthew and every other happiness practitioner I know hmm, works on. It's life will throw shit at me, I will find a way to be the best version of myself and then deal with it. Wow. It's been yeah. a pleasure. Thank Same you. Same here. Thank <laughs> you very much for having me. Thank, Thank you. you.